Hello and welcome to yet another tutorial by Davies Media Design. My name is Michael Davies and today I'll be showing you five things you didn't know you could do with GIMP. So some of the tools I'll be going over in today's tutorial are actually pretty common, but they have hidden features that I bet you guys didn't know about. For example, there's the eraser tool, there's the bucket fill tool, and the clone tool, and we'll be going over those, as well as some brand new tools that are coming out in GIMP 2.10 that are already available in GIMP 2.9.8, which is the development version, or the version I'll be using in today's tutorial. But before we get into that, of course, I wanna show you guys my website, daviesmediadesign.com slash tutorials. There's tons of video and text tutorials on here, so definitely check it out. I'll include a link to that in the description. You can also enroll in our Udemy GIMP photo editing course from beginner to pro photo retoucher. And I'll include a link to that as well as links to our social media and other pertinent links in the description. All right, so let's go ahead and get started here. I'm gonna use one of the brand new tools found in GIMP 2.9.8. Um, if you guys don't have this version, you can download it for free on the GIMP website. And GIMP 2.10 is coming out soon. That'll be the stable version of what I'm using here. But this new tool is called the Unified Transform tool right here. And this is basically, as I mentioned before, an all-in-one transform tool. Super useful. There's something similar to it in Photoshop that you guys have probably used if you've ever used Photoshop. But I'm gonna show you guys how this works by, uh, I have an image open here, and by the way, I got this image on Pixabay and I'll include all the links to the images I used today in the description. And I just opened this image into GIMP by going to File Open and selecting the file from my computer and uh, clicking Open. But just go to Edit, Copy, and that'll copy this image. And so in my example, I'm gonna use replacing the image of a computer here. And I'll go to Edit, paste, and this is gonna paste my moose photo in here. And it's gonna add this as a floating selection layer, so I'll go ahead and click to create a new layer here. And you can double click and rename this moose if you want. But in the past, you would have to use the various transform tools to get this to fit inside that computer screen, um, scale this down, change the perspective, maybe do some other things to it. But with this unified transform tool, it's all in one place, so all I gotta do is click on this image here, and you'll see now that I've got a variety of different shapes and boxes over here, and let's see if I can zoom out actually. So I'll grab my zoom tool and hold control to zoom out, and I'll grab my unified transform tool again, so I'll click on that layer. And by the way, make sure you're on your uh, layer that you're adjusting here that you're wanting to transform. So usually when you use a transform tool, you'll only see one set of boxes, but here you've got a uh, box and then you've got a diamond and uh, this diamond is transparent and this one is a bit opaque and then you've got this box up here and you'll notice that when I hover my mouse over these areas my mouse pointer turns into the mouse pointer that you'll usually find in other tools. Um, so for example right now you can see uh, this is the scale tool and my mouse pointer looks like the scale tool mouse pointer and that's because this is telling me that this is the scale tool. Now when I hover over this other uh, diamond right here you'll see that my mouse pointer now looks like the perspective tool. And that's because this box here controls the perspective of the image. When I hover over this one, you'll see that my mouse pointer changes to the shear tool right here. And that's because this adjusts uh, shearing in the image. And then again, this one is the scale tool. So as I hover over each box, you'll see which tool the box corresponds to. So I'll start by scaling the image down because I want the image to be about the size of the laptop screen. So I'll go ahead and hover my mouse over this corner here and drag. And you'll notice that if I don't hold anything on my keyboard, this kind of drags all over the place and it's stretching my image out. If I hold shift while I drag, it will uh, scale it proportionately. And so also you'll notice right there when I hovered my mouse over the middle of the image here, it turned into the move tool and that allows me to move my image. And so I'm gonna scale this down a little more until it's about the size we need. And just for time's sake, I'm not gonna make this completely perfect. So now we've got this about the size we need, and now I want to change the perspective so that the corners of this image fit in the corners of the laptop screen. So I'll just hover over one of these diamonds here and drag this to the corner, and hover over here, drag it to the corner, and do the same here. And now we've changed the perspective of this image so that it fits into the screen. And there's also, again, the shear tool if you guys need to, you know, basically shear this image so that it fits into whatever perspective or whatever object you're trying to fit this into. But just know that this is basically combining multiple transform tools into one, and that way it saves you a bunch of steps and it makes 
uh, GIMP a lot more flexible when you're trying to do projects like this. So I'll go ahead and hit transform. And now that's applied the unified transform. And obviously we would need to add the reflection to this laptop screen in order for it to look more realistic. But you can see that now the image is the right size and the right perspective here. And uh, we only had to use one tool to accomplish that. So the next feature I'll show you guys is called the transform lock. And a lot of people mistake this for something that it's not. Um, they think that it's used to lock layers. So right now I'm on my uh, space-time poster here that I made in one of my other tutorials on how to make a movie poster. And I've got a bunch of layers here, and you'll see that these layers have locks on them. And in other programs, these locks usually indicate, you know, locking a layer so you can't edit on it. But what these are are transform locks. And when I have certain layers locked, so for instance, I have all these four layers locked, and these all correspond to the black hole here. I'll go ahead and hide my astronaut so you can see. And if I hide all these, You'll see that it hides all the black hole elements. So I'll go ahead and show these again. So what this transform lock does is when I'm on an active layer and I come over here to a transform tool such as the scale tool, when I scale down this one layer, so I'll click on it, hold shift, scale it down, or I can actually scale it up too and go ahead and recenter it. So I scaled this up. Now, when I hit scale, you'll notice that it's going to apply this transform to all of the layers that have the icon locked right here. And you can click on this next to the eye icon to add the transform lock or remove the transform lock. But I'll go ahead and hit scale. And you'll see that it performs the scale multiple times, the scale operation. So there's three and it did a fourth one there. And so now that's actually performed the transform on all of these layers, all four of these layers, not just that black hole layer. So that's what the transform lock is for. So it's not there to lock the layers and ensure that you can't edit that layer anymore. What it's there for is to uh, lock layers together so that you can transform them all at once and not have to go in individually and perform the transform. And now I'll go back and unhide my uh, astronaut here and now we have a larger black hole. So that's the transform lock. Very useful feature in my opinion and it's something that not a lot of people know about. So the next feature I'm going to show you guys involves a very commonly used tool, the bucket fill tool. You guys are probably very familiar with this if you've used GIMP for any period of time. And the bucket fill tool has a couple hidden features in there, uh, mainly in the tool options that allow you to enhance the tool and uh, do a couple things that you didn't know you could do and get better results. So I'll start by creating a rectangle select area and I'll go ahead and draw this. I clicked and dragged to draw this on my artboard here or on my canvas. And now I'll grab my bucket fill tool and go ahead and fill this in and go to select none. And so this is how a bucket fill tool is usually used. You know, you just fill in the shape. Now let's say I change my color to a different color like a blue and I have my bucket fill tool selected and I go ahead and try to fill this in. And you'll notice that it fills everything around the square. And something that a lot of people don't know about the bucket fill tool is that by default, the affected area over here is set to fill similar colors. And basically what that's saying is that any color you click on, this is going to fill. So I'll undo this. If I click on this rectangle, it's gonna fill the rectangle in here. Otherwise, if I click on the white area, it's gonna fill in that white area. And so what it's doing is it's choosing similar colors and it's filling those colors in. Now, if I hold shift and click, it's gonna fill in the entire thing and it's not just gonna fill in one color. So that's one thing about the bucket fill tool that a lot of people don't know about. Now, there's also some other features here that are really cool in my opinion. And so I'll name this square and then I'll create another layer and name this square two. Now let's say that you want to draw a square on um, this layer for whatever reason and it overlaps with this square here. And so I'll grab my bucket fill tool and fill this in. And then we come up here to another layer and we draw another square over here. And we go ahead and fill this in with another color. Call it red. Select none. So now we have squares on three different layers. And there's a cool feature here with the bucket fill tool where if I come over here to my background layer, so this is the bottom layer of all three layers that we're using here. I can come over here to sample merged and check that and make sure that this is still set to fill similar colors, which is the default setting there. Now, if I come over and click on this black rectangle here, instead of filling in the entire black rectangle, um, like it would usually do if I didn't have sample merge checked, instead what it does is it only fills in the parts of the square 
that don't overlap with the other two squares. So it's basically taking into account the other two squares on the other two layers, and that's what sample merge does. It takes information from all layers in the composition, not just the active layer that you're on, and it combines them to produce uh, whatever effect it is you're trying to produce. So uh, another cool thing about this, I can, and I'm still on this bottom layer, remember, I can click on uh, this square, which is on the square two layer, or I can click on this square, which is on the uh, first square layer here, but it's not actually filling in the square on this layer, it's all filling in what's on uh, that bottom layer here, and that's what Sample Merge does. It takes the shape from the other layers above, and it allows you to interact with them. In this case, it's allowed us to fill in uh, squares in the shape of the squares in the layers above, and uh, now we've got this sort of combination of squares here, but it's only for squares or shapes or anything that's overlapping the original shape that you're trying to fill in or overlapping the original item on the layer. So this is just a cool way to uh, combine shapes for multiple layers onto one layer without having to do a bunch of steps like add alpha to selection and then coming back to your original active layer. You can just do it all on the original layer uh, so long as you have sample merge checked and it's the bottom layer. Now one last thing with the bucket fill tool that I want to show you guys. So I'll go ahead and grab my ellipse select tool and draw an ellipse here and go ahead and fill this in with like a red color and go to select none. Now let's say that uh, we want to change the color of this ellipse area here. And so we're gonna come over here and change our color to black. And when I go to fill this in, there's a faint trace of the red below here that you can see still, and it's not too bad actually on here, but if I zoom in, you can see there's a bunch of red in here. And this is a problem that a lot of people have had in all versions of GIMP. Um, which is that when you try to fill over an existing area, you still get remnants of what was the original color before. Well, if I hit Control Z and I go back to my bucket fill tool, I can turn up the threshold here. And basically what that's doing is that it wants to not be as discriminatory um, towards some of these pixels here. So um, I, I crank the threshold up quite a bit here and there's still some of the red pixels showing. But basically what's happening if I hit Control Z, these pixels are all very red, whereas the pixels up here, you can see um, they're sort of fading out a little bit. Um, they're a bit more transparent than the original pixels or the pixels in the center here. So by turning the threshold up, basically what I'm saying is that I want to be able to fill in some of these more transparent pixels. And you do have to adjust the threshold amount to try to get uh, more of these pixels covered without overdoing it or doing too much because it will start to spill over outside of here. But you'll notice that as I'm turning up the threshold, it's covering more and more of these red pixels, these blurry red pixels along the outside edge here to the point where uh, right around here, I'm starting to basically get all of those red pixels covered. So you can see that now pretty much all of those red pixels are covered and you get a better uh, overlapping fill. So just keep that in mind when you're using the bucket fill tool. If you're trying to fill over an existing object in the image, but you're getting a lot of spillover from the color underneath, just turn the threshold up and that's gonna do a better job of filling in some of those uh, outer edge pixels. Now the next thing I'm gonna show you involves the eraser tool and a lot of you guys have used this tool obviously. Um, you know, anytime you're drawing something and you wanna get rid of it, you're gonna go ahead and grab your eraser tool. But sometimes you erase something and then later on you wanna bring it back. And that can be a problem because usually uh, the method for bringing back colors that you've already erased is you have to just undo until you get back to that thing that you erased. But there might be a couple things ahead of that that you've been working on that you wanna keep and you don't wanna to have to undo all that and erase all that progress. Well, I'm gonna show you guys a feature called the unerase feature. And basically what this is is a feature that allows you to paint back the colors that you've erased with the eraser tool. So one really important thing to note is that this feature isn't gonna work unless you have an alpha channel on your image, which means that you have a transparency channel on here. So if I click on my main image and I right click on here, I can come down to add alpha channel and that's going to add a uh, transparency channel to this image. And if you don't do that, this isn't gonna work. So make sure you do that before you're editing any image you're working on. And now if I paint on here and I say I want to erase this fox here for whatever reason, it's a pretty damn cute fox, so I don't know why you would want to erase it, but let's say hypothetically you do. So now I've erased this fox, it's totally gone. And let's say now in a later step, I've got my uh, paintbrush tool here and I'm decreasing the size with my bracket keys on my keyboard. And let's say you paint a bunch of stuff in here for whatever reason. And then you realize all of a sudden that you didn't want to erase that fox, but you don't want to undo everything because if you hit undo, it's going to undo all those beautiful squiggles that you just drew on the picture. 
So I'll go ahead and hit Control Y to redo all that. So one way to take care of this is you grab your eraser tool and I'll go ahead and use the brackets on my keyboard to increase the size of the brush. All you have to do is hold the Alt key on your keyboard and you'll see a little minus sign above your eraser tool. And now I can actually just paint all that back in, um, all the fox that I erased before. And it's just painting all those colors that I erased back in without having to go back and undo everything that I did here. So super useful feature, really quick feature, but um, really potent, really powerful, especially for people who, you know, have erased something on accident and need to go back and paint that back in. So uh, really cool feature there. And the last feature I'm going to show you guys involves the clone tool. And uh, I'm going to show you a couple things about the clone tool that are really cool that maybe you guys didn't know. Okay, so here's the hypothetical scenario. I've drawn these four squiggles here on this uh, fox image, but I want to erase one of these squiggles and I've drawn them all directly onto the canvas here. So I can't just use my eraser tool. It's going to create a transparency, but I also can't just come to my undo history over here and uh, come back to one of my previous steps because it undoes one of my squiggles in the wrong order. Let's say, you know, so I painted this squiggle second and then this one third and this one fourth. Well, let's say I want to get rid of the second squiggle, but I want to keep the third and the fourth. I can't just go back and hit undo because it, again, it's going to undo these two squiggles. And for whatever reason, I want to keep these on here. And also I didn't paint these on a layer, which by the way, you always want to um, paint stuff on another layer, but I, there could be some cases where you can't do that. But if you can always try to create a new layer before you're painting on uh, your canvas. But let's say hypothetically you didn't, you painted directly on this layer here um, and you want to undo some of this. What I can do is I can go ahead and go to file, export as, and I can export this uh, photo here. I'll just call it Fox Photo 2 because I already saved this when I was uh, testing this out earlier. So I'll hit export, set the quality to 100. And you can also just go to file, save as, and uh, save this as an XCF if you want to keep this as the native XCF file in GIMP. So go ahead and go to File Open now. And I'm going to come over to uh, these files that we saved. So here's the JPEG version here, or you can also do the XCF version. So um, I'll go ahead and try with the XCF version for now. So here's what we're working on now, but there's no undo history here. But I can come over here to our original and I can go back to basically when there were no squiggles here, um, or I can really go back to any undo point uh, that we've been working on here. So I can go here if I wanted, or I can go here, or I can just go back to before we did any of the squiggles. And now what I want to do is grab my clone tool and go ahead and hold control. And I can click anywhere on this image here and I'll come over to my tool options. Just make sure that the alignment is set to registered. Otherwise this isn't going to work. And then I'll come over here to my uh, duplicate that I created. And again, let's say we wanted to erase only the second squiggle here and none of the other ones. Now I can go ahead and paint um, over this squiggle here and it's going, going to erase only that second one and none of the other ones. And so um, I'm also not erasing anything from the original layer. I'm not erasing this and showing transparency behind it. Um, so this is a really effective tool. In Photoshop, they call it a history brush. And so uh, GIMP says that this is sort of a workaround to creating your own uh, history brush. And it just allows a little bit more flexibility on a project. And I can do uh, whatever I want. I can also erase this squiggle if I wanted to, and it'll get rid of that. And I'll just mention one more time, you have to uh, set the alignment to register just the way the clone tool works. When it's set to register, the clone tool um, on this image is matching the mouse location of the clone tool on the image you're working on. So um, for instance, I'm right here on the image. You'll see that was where I left off with my mouse. And if I come over here, you'll see that that's exactly where the uh, clone tool brush is. All right, guys. So those are five things you didn't know you could do in GIMP. If you know of any other hidden features or cool things you can do in GIMP, please leave them in the comments below. I'd love to hear them. Otherwise, if you like this tutorial, please subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash Davies Media Design. You can also visit our website at daviesmediadesign.com slash tutorials or enroll in our GIMP photo editing course on Udemy. And of course, I'll include a link to that as well as a link to our social media pages in the description. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.